Thank you. It's always fun to hear how awesome I am. So <laughs> I really do appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here today with you and uh, that you're taking the time out of your lunch to come down. And, and I hope that uh, what I have to talk about might be of some use to you. Um, if not, you're getting lunch. So and hopefully I can make you laugh a couple of times. But um, I want to talk about editing your inner stories to remove the negative self-talk. So basically, this whole thing is just say nice things to yourself. OK, so that's it. I'm going to go now. You can enjoy your lunch. <laughs> um, I, do like to have a, I, I do like to put a few disclaimers out before these types of things. So first of all, we're talking about this. I do get it. Life is hard. Okay? Life is hard. Um, I don't claim to know anything about your life individually and what's going on with you. And um, I'm not here to question any life decisions that you've ever made. Okay? I'm not here to challenge you or do any of that kind of stuff. And also, finally, I do know that I'm a white male who has American citizenship. Okay, I get it. I've gotten a pretty good hand dealt to me in some places, but along the way, I think they've forgotten to send me my easy ticket. I'm waiting for it to show up here eventually. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's really funny because I've, I've been talking nationally for four years now. I'm going to conferences, big conferences, things. This is the first time I would say in 20 some years that I've been concerned about getting up in front of someone and talking. And it's not because I'm ever scared about actually talking, um, but what we're talking about, it was much easier to do it seven months ago when life was really, really good for me. You know, when I had this major crash going on and I'm coming back up. And so I don't ever want to come across as being like, uh, one of those people, you know, who's taken the idea of fake it till you make it the wrong direction, you know, <laughs> and you, you're just being this false person and showing how great life is when really things suck. Okay? So life is not so fantastic for me right now, but I'm still using these same things I want to talk about to actually move to my next spot, to actually move through that difficult time that I've been going through over the last six months and move out of it. And it's nice to say that I am moving back out of it. And, um, but it was, it was really tough um, coming out with, you know, making sure I've got the right things to talk about today and, and doing it in a way that hopefully will be useful for you. So, um, and because I really do hate that term, you know, the whole fake it till you make it, because when it gets used that wrong way, I mean, it's one thing to be like, all right, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to completely do this yet, but I'm going to keep trying to do it. And I'm going to keep trying to do it. It's another thing to be like, I'm making all the money in the world and I'm awesome and everything and you should do what I'm doing when you're really like just trying to keep that head afloat, right? Just doggy paddling and just trying to survive. And I think, you know, a lot of us feel like that sometimes, you know, we're, we're trying to figure it out. And a lot of it comes from the stuff that we're telling ourselves, these stories that we have inside ourselves. And, um, and what I do have to say here, the truth is it might not work for you. I recognize, you know, that the stuff that works in my life may be very specific to me because of my life experiences, how I grew up, what I've learned, the things that I've done in my life. But I will tell you this, that you will not know if this works for you or not unless you actually try to put it to work for you. And until you do that, you can't say, you know what, and just dismiss it out of hand. After you've put some work into it and it's not that thing, then you shift gears and try to find a different direction to go. And that's what life's about, you know, is this constant, which is, <laughs> it's amazing, right? It's long, <laughs> and it gets longer. <laughs> My grandma, she passed away about was almost four years now. She lived to 102. It's a long time. By the end, she was just, you know, just eating, like, brown sugar and butter. And the doctor's like, eat whatever you want to eat. You're 102. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so there's some good things to look forward to there, but there's a lot of other stuff, you know, in the way, like, like this constant, you know, trying to grow and learn and, and do things and uh, trying to get it what it is that you want from life. Um, so who am I? You know, that I think that would probably take longer than an hour to actually figure out. And usually when people ask, you know, what, who, who are you, you know, what, what's going on? They really want to know is what is it that you do? And um, what I do is I work with authors. I work with authors to help them um, edit their stories so that it can become more emotionally resonant with their readers. So I'm not an editor who goes through and like, corrects grammar and puts in punctuation and things like that. I go through and tear stories apart and say, okay, so you're trying to reach 
um, this age group and you're trying to connect with this audience, well, we need to adjust these characters because those characters aren't going to feel real to this, these people. And, and when you can do that, all of a sudden your career is, is upward, upward movement. And I've had a lot of fun doing it. Like, um, I've worked with, again, you know, I've worked with New York Times bestselling authors. I've got uh, a few of them on, that I work with on a regular basis, which is just fun. But it's also fun to teach a class where people have, haven't put down a word yet onto paper, and they're just trying to learn how to do this. And um, it's been a really interesting ride. And, and I've always had this love for story. You know, ever since I was a kid, I've always, you know, enjoyed stories, enjoyed storytelling, enjoyed listening to people tell stories and things. And I, one of the things I realize now is that story really is our native language. It doesn't matter what country you're from, story is the native language. Story is how you explain life. Story is how you share things. You don't come in and hand people a memo with the list of facts you did over the weekend, right? You know, like you're in there, you're telling them what happened, you know, and you want to share and experience these things. Um, and that's, that's what it, it starts, you know, at birth. We start telling our, our children the stories, you know, and, and they, they get a natural way of, of uh, watching stories. And stories come in all forms, right? Some stories are truth. Some stories are straight-up lies. Some stories are lies that have more truth in them than real truth does. <laughs> and the opposite can be true as well. Some of them are true, but they come across as, as false. And so story can be broken down to this idea that, Basically, is a story is just this purse in a place who has a problem. You know, that's, that's a real story. And um, working in news for over a decade, the, the problem was we gave that portion of the story, but there's another little element to, to make stories work, and that's a resolution. And in, in news, we were always this person in a place that's got a problem, but we never resolved anything with it. We never figured out how to fix it. And in, when you're reading books or watching a movie, that's usually something that resolves at the end. And so you can end up with this negative story all the time coming at you if, you if you don't remember that you've got to figure out how it comes together. Like, how does this story resolve itself? And how, how does this problem in this person, in this place, how do they overcome that? And I think that's one of the things that holds us back in life so much is that we, we forget that we have an ability to overcome. And, um, and this fascinates me. And... We take a look at, you know, I, I, I had my, when my kids were younger and they watched a lot of the cartoons, um, a lot of cartoons, they don't even have words in them, right? You know, like you, you, like you can tell a story, you don't even have to have words in it. And uh, even when I was growing up, my father, he loved Roadrunners. Anyone who remembers Roadrunner, right? Okay, some, all right, good. Um, <laughs> always have to know your audience. So, you know, uh, <laughs> Coyote and Roadrunner, he, he loved it. And I realized later the reason why he loved it so much was because it was like a direct representation of his life. He was a coyote. Like he was always trying so hard <laughs> to capture his, his metaphorical roadrunner and um, just getting slapped off the mountainside or hit or changed or whatever. And, but he loved that stuff. <laughs> he, he, and uh, it was fun to share that with him. But... Um, but he never stopped trying. I, I loved that about my father growing up watching him. You know, it was like he never stopped trying to, to do that. Um, but sometimes those stories, sometimes we forget that we need to figure out how that you can actually overcome it. We never saw a story with, uh, with a coyote having Roadrunner <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> you know, I don't <laughs> And um, story is also like when you really think about it, story, we have to have an agreed upon meaning for things, especially when we start talking about books and and writing and reading, because um, it's not just a picture anymore. Now we have to form an idea with it. So if I say the word house, and I say the word home, you know, they both have an H and an O, they both have some similar things there, but they don't form the shape of a building, you know, anyway, and they don't really represent exactly what it is. And in the word house, and in the word home, they actually have different types of meanings. Like when you think of the word house, that can kind of be a representation of any building of where you go. But when you think of home, home has something different to it, right? Home adds in the, a feeling of perhaps family, perhaps safety. You know, home is where the heart is. Home, I go, I'm going home for the holidays, but I'm going over to visit someone at their house, right? And it, it's, 
an agreed upon thing, though. We've, we've agreed the meaning of words. And that's a, an important thing to remember is that uh, when, we, when we have to start having these agreements, um, that it's shared, these stories are shared. And we start to see, or at least I started to see, um, that really what's happening here when we start sharing these stories, we start understanding, we start building this, is we're starting to build a world. We're starting to build a reality in ourselves, in, the, in our families, in our friendships, in our work, in our environments. Wherever we're at, we're starting to build this world around us. And um, with the words we use, the stories that we tell. And I really liked, um, I really liked the, the, the time I realized that, you know, that I had the ability to, to share something. So the, the bear and the cooler story. So this is something, <laughs> this happened to me when I was 16 years old, and I was over at, uh, I was actually living in the area here at the time, uh, but we were over at a scout camp, Treasure Mountain Scout Camp, which is just down uh, below the Tetons, beautiful place, and uh, we were, thought we had everything secured up on top of a shelter, you know, had all of our coolers up there, because they had bears in the area, and we wake up one morning, um, our scout master was yelling, you know, there's a bear out there. We kind of thought it wasn't there because we thought he was just messing with us. But sure enough, we pop out, and there is. And it's up there on the top, and it's like rooting through coolers and knocking stuff over. And so we make all kinds of noise and bring in pots and pans, and the bear takes off. And it's a mess. I mean, there's mess everywhere. There's just food all over the place and wrappers and everything. So we're out there cleaning it all up. And as we're cleaning it up, the sun's starting to come up finally. And as I'm bent over here taking this up, I look at my friend, and he's like, Clark, Bear. And I turn around, and sure enough, within this distance, the bear was back. And not only was it back, it hacked my cooler, my little cooler, right in its mouth. And I'm 16. <laughs> so I reach out, and I yell <laughs> that it's my cooler, and I want it back. And, and the bear kind of freaks out, and I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. And it lets go, and it runs off. And uh, I was like... Yeah, I felt pretty cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I still have the cooler because <laughs> you, that's a trophy you don't give away. But, um, but you know, like it wasn't, I, I started to, you know, people would, would talk about that and, um, and I started to develop it. So, yep, happened in the Tetons. Yep, there was a bear. Yep, tore our stuff up. Yep, my friend was there and told me the bear was behind me. And yep, I grabbed it. But did he really stutter? You know, was there really that much stuff on the ground? I don't know. You know, was, was I feeling confident when I grabbed it or was I just stupid? Like <laughs> the questions of those seem to be irrelevant once you start to develop the story because the story in itself takes on its own life. So the other people who were there may tell the story differently, right? If you go, you have 18 eyewitnesses, guess what you have? 18 different stories. <laughs> it's why eyewitness testimony is so poor on the stand. Because people remember things so differently. Their minds start to alter things. They change it. They embellish to make themselves look better. You know, you don't want to tell people that you got taken advantage of, right? So instead, you don't tell that part of the story. Or you start to change things. Or the audience matters, right? Like if I was to go out and uh, have this awesome weekend, let's say I'm 18, I'm having this awesome weekend out on the lake, and there's drinking involved, and I'm doing things that I shouldn't be according to my mom, and I go tell my mom about the weekend, do you think I'm telling her about the drinking or anything like that? No, not at all. But I'm telling my friends about it, that's a different story. <laughs> hey, and it might even get bigger, <laughs> how awesome it was, and what they missed out on. And I think that's some of the things we miss, or, or we're having, we're seeing this in social media today, that we're getting a skewed images of these stories that people share. And in fact, um, it's disappointing to hear this, but we're, we're starting to have depression formed out of social media because few people look at this stuff and they're like, I wish my life was that awesome. I wish I had that kind of cool stuff going on. And that person is probably just like, you know, they got the right angle and they got to figure this out. And they've taken 14 different pictures to get that, you know, normal moment, <laughs> unfiltered and that perfect pose to toss it out there. So being able to tell and share stories yeah, there has to be something with it, with the truth of it in it, to help someone move to a different place. And it's, it's really interesting when you think about that, because the story in itself matters so greatly from who's telling it, the point of view. If, if we're talking about 
writing point of view is like, well, is it written in first person or second person or third person? When we're talking about our life, we're the point of view character. We're the point of view of that story. We're the ones who are telling that story. And it's our life. And so I think one of the greatest truths from Star Wars, <laughs> I watched it like 180 times as a kid. It was one of the approved movies at my house so when I was growing up and uh, wore that tape out. But the, the best truth is like, Obi-Wan Kenobi says, you know, many of the truths we cling to rely greatly on our own point of view, right? Like we believe what we, you know, we, we hold on to that truth, even though, because and he was talking specifically about the idea of Darth Vader being, not being Luke's fire and being killed by him and all this type of stuff because he altered it to fit his own perception of reality. And it's such an interesting idea that we, we do this, that we change these things so that we can, we can see the world like we want to see it. Um, Plato told the allegory of the cave. And if you've never heard this, it, it's pretty cool. It, um, basically, if you watch the movie The Matrix, it's The Matrix. There's several other movies that are basically the allegory of the cave. But the idea is that there's these people, these three people are chained up inside this cave. And behind them, so they're chained, they can only watch one direction. Behind them is a light to fire and it's got these shadows, and they're hearing voices outside, and that's being projected upon the wall. That's all they see are the shadows. They see the shadows, they hear the voices. And they take one of these people, and they unchain them, and they take them out into the real world, and they show them everything that's out here. This is what you're really hearing. This is what you're really seeing. This is what's really taking place. And they take that person back in, and they chain them up. And that person tries to explain to the other two what the real world is. Okay? This is what it really is. And they're like, no, you're, you're crazy. No, it's the shadow thing, and it's the voice thing. Like, it's, this is real, not what you went out and saw. That You're crazy. <laughs> hey? You know, the person who's walking down the street talking to themselves are like, wow, that dude's crazy, as I'm sitting here talking to myself in my head the whole time, right? <laughs> and having all this huge conversation or, or playing back what I hope some, is going to happen in the next meeting I have to go to or, you know, what I would have said to them if I just had thought about this and play this whole thing back. So we have this voice, right? We've got this voice in our head that's constantly jabbering to us all the time. And we can, we can be connected to it in this voice of reality, in our own reality, right? We, we build a reality and perception um, of where things are at and where it is that we're going. And I'm realizing I have no idea what time. So if I'm getting like over time, will you let me know? Because I just kind of talk. You can ask. It's like, I just kind of go. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we get this, we start building a reality. Like I said, we, we build shared reality, but we also build a reality in ourself of how we see the world. So, and sometimes this reality gets questioned. Sometimes this reality gets challenged. In 1999, my reality was awesome. I was working on my second film. I had uh, I'd been married for almost two years at that point. I'm, well, like 20, 24 or something, pretty young. Uh, we we're expecting our first children we're going to have triplets. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have this amazing life coming up and all this type of stuff. It was fantastic. It was beautiful. I couldn't, you know, everything that I've got, I've got it all planned out. And I'm seeing how life is going to unfold and I have the kids and we'll get this finished and the movie will be done and we'll go to Hollywood and we'll get work out there and all this type of things. And then November happened in 1999. We'd, we'd gone over six months with this pregnancy and, things have, and it's a dangerous pregnancy with triplets and things have been okay. And we go in for the checkup, and things are not okay anymore. And a couple days later, she went into labor, and we delivered three children, and two days later, we had no children. And you talk about your reality crumbling. Like it's, 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 it's powerful. It's a powerful thing. Of course, my wife was completely devastated. I was completely devastated. We both were just depressed. You know, we've, I can't, you know, tell everything that she would, was going through, but myself, I just saw it all gone. I was like, what was the point? What's the point of any of it now? And I, I went to bed for like three months, right? I'm depressed for three months, and I couldn't get things back on track. Like I was having such a difficult time. I'd really lost the drive, the, the why even try? And, and I started seeing things limited. I started seeing everything is limited. We had another child, and I protected that child with everything. 
because I was so scared, so scared of losing. You know, I wasn't out there trying. I wasn't giving. I wasn't doing these things anymore because my mindset had shifted. The story that I was telling myself shifted to you have to protect everything in your life. And this is all you have. And if you risk it, you're going to lose it. So I, I had stopped giving, you know, and that's a terrible thing. So I wasn't giving love. You know, if you want love, you got to give love. If you want friends, you got to be a friend. If you want to make money, you've got to be willing to risk money. If you want to do these things, which risk versus reward, it's so, it's so powerful. Like, and you can get into a mindset, this limited mindset where you're like, I got to save it all. I got to protect it all. I got to hold it all. And I can't give anything out. So guess what happened to that marriage? Okay. We never could recover from that because we had locked ourselves up away from each other because it was just so scary. And that mindset lasted until almost 2007 for me. That was a lot of years. And I just didn't, you know, I, I just went back to doing news and I gave up on trying to get anything else to happen. And in, um, I turned 31 and it was really funny that, um, I had left when I was 21, I was doing construction and I was like, I'm not going to be like all the rest of these guys here and doing this for the rest of my life. I got dreams. I got goals. I got ambitions. At 31, I'm building a house up in, up in Victor. And I'm like, where did those 10 years go? <laughs> and what am I doing? And so at 31, I decided I, I need to make a change. You know, I got to change things back. I got to figure out where I am. I got to figure out what I want to do. And um, I joined the army. <laughs> and when I was at basic training at 30, almost 32, they're like, you should have bought the car right? You know, midlife crisis. I should have gone and bought the fancy car and not joined the army. But <laughs> the army put me back on track. The army reminded me that I had power inside of me. It reminded me that I had discipline. It reminded me that I can accomplish things. And those things were already there. Those things were already there. Those things are with all of us right from the beginning of life. But somehow, sometimes they get driven out of us. And we, that negative self-talk in our head can drive that stuff out. And so I had to have that little push. The army definitely gave that to me. And we, uh, we deployed to Iraq and as prepped preparation for Iraq now, and, and just a backstory, I've, I've been remarried at this point. Um, apparently I'm not a fantastic communicator and I'm still trying to learn all of that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we got better and then got, anyway, it, it'll come along later. So, uh, at this point though, we've got a child who I've barely seen, by the way, because I've been gone to military trainings and prepping to leave for Iraq, and then I'll be gone to Iraq. It's really seriously almost like I've seen this kid for like three months out of the three years he's alive type of deal in the first three years of life, and um, at different points and little times. And we're prepping to go to Iraq, and unlike some of the young guys who are like, yeah, just go to Iraq and we'll come back, whatever, I recognize <laughs> that... I'm putting myself into a combat zone. And although it's not like World War II or World War I, where the casualty numbers were just ginormous, there's still a danger. And I wanted to be prepared in case a danger came. I had, uh, I had read a book uh, years before that called The Hagakur, which was this book on samurai life, like actually written at the end of the samurai uh, um, sagas, you know, by this guy that was a samurai. And he was discipline or like detailing out like everything they need to do. And one of the things is, is like, you've got to meditate on your own death every day. You got to think of all the ways you can die so you can face those fears. And then when you get into the situation, you won't be a You won't be scared of it. You know, face the fear now mentally and you can come overcome it. So that's what I was doing. I was prepping for that. And so in case I didn't come back, I wanted to make sure my kids knew who I was, not who they thought I was, but who I actually was. So I actually, it's the first time um, since I'd been a high school student and my girlfriend told me after she was reading my book that I probably should write the stuff that I know and <laughs> kind of took me off of writing for a long time, but I decided I would write them. It's nonfiction, of course, you know, and just detailing my life and, and so that they could have that. And, uh, that was a good step for me though, because it got me back into writing. And when I got to Iraq and of course, clearly I'm back. They didn't reincarnate me or anything. I'm here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but it was, it was some touch and go places over there, but, um, I really saw over there 
something different. And I don't think it would have happened to me had I not been assigned where I was, because I was, I was stationed to run a security gate for the United Nations with me and one other U.S. soldier, and we worked with Fijian soldiers and German soldiers and eventually trained Iraqi soldiers to replace us, and then also worked with all the different nations coming in and out every day. And so I really started to see, well, my goodness, <laughs> everything that I assumed was real is only real here because we agreed on it. Over here, society rules are different, how things operate are different, even in a Western culture country like Germany, things are different, you know? Like the whole thing, I'm like, wow, this is such a, just this little balancing act that we do, this little agreed upon deal of our own realities. It's kind of fun. Yes, we are here, we are, all of us are here, this is a real life. Not sure if you're here, because I've seen you other places. So, like, sometimes I get curious about that, like if I make that up. But <laughs> I can definitely say we're all here. So I don't mean that with, like, it's not real, but the idea that, uh, that we do kind of make up some of this stuff. We do agree upon some of this stuff and make it up. And um, I started writing fiction over there because it was the only way I could kind of work through what's going on. Again, truth in fiction, truth in lies. Uh, because I couldn't write exactly what was really happening because then it would have to be checked to see, <laughs> make sure I didn't you know, say things I wasn't supposed to say. So I started writing fiction over there. And it was just really interesting to, to work through that and start to really learn how it is. And it, that's what propelled me into where I'm at now. But, um, but I started to see it with my friend um, who had been in the Army with for years now. And, like, we're brothers at this point. And, and uh, he would get so worked up about things because he was set into his mind in stone that his day needed to go this way. All these things have to happen in this order. And if one thing's out of place, all of a sudden the world's ending, right? <laughs> you know, and um, <laughs> we definitely all know someone who's like that, right? If it doesn't work out and he would get so disappointed when things wouldn't work out, it would devastate him. And so we have to have um, a mental uh, flexibility, not moral flexibility. We can, we can absolutely hold on to the things that we believe even when someone else in the room doesn't believe us a, a, as we do. We can hold on to that, but we have to have a me mental flexibility to be able to work through these things, work around problems, work with people that have differing opinions in us so that we don't have this, right? We don't keep hitting our head up against the wall and devastating our life because it's not going exactly like we think it's going to supposed to go, the script that we're writing. And, um, and in that, you know, holding on to that belief and holding on to that idea of this more flexible idea, one of the things we have to take into place and into account, just like in any good story, problems are going to happen. Failure is going to happen. When we see a hero right, work through things, like we know, we go into a story, we know things are going to go bad for them, <laughs> right? Not, nothing's going to work perfectly. And the thing you want to have happen that's going to be really good might fall apart for them. But when we understand, we can take that into our own life. Yeah, bad stuff's going to happen. Not everything's going to run perfect all the time. You know, even when things are running perfectly for a while, something could come along and throw out the works. But if we have a flexibility and understand that we can move around that, um, it can give us a lot of strength and it allows us to be able to adapt. You know, it's one of the things that our minds are best designed for is to solve problems and to adapt to change. Like that's what... That's what we are as humans. Like we just adapt to our environment, and um, when that environment changes, if we, as long as we're not trying to fight against the environmental change, like it's gonna change. Things are gonna change. Do you think anybody that was sitting in Rome, you know, at the height of the Roman Empire, thought this is this is gonna change? No, right? Everybody thinks that everything is gonna last exactly how it is at this moment, right? You know, is America gonna be here 200 years from now? I don't know. Okay, like. It, but I will tell you this, if it is, it will be different, <laughs> okay? If, we, uh, if they unlock uh, and we can live to 200 years, I guarantee you things are going to be different, you know, when you get to that point. I was talking to my grandma before she had died and going through the events that take place in his, her life. There were not cars before, you know, and she went from no cars to, like, uh, internet communication speed, like over her lifetime. <laughs> okay? There are some changes to take place in that. Um, and uh, and it, it's, it's kind of a cool place to be, but it, it all changes. And when we start, and so I'd get into sometimes um, 
little little arguments with Blakeman occasionally. You know, to we were, that was his name, and because uh, we didn't see eye to eye on everything. Like I said, we we're brothers <laughs> almost. You know, um, but but we we could work through things, and that's what it would take. And um, it's funny, my my oldest boy, who's almost sixteen now and driving. Oh, good lord, he's driving now. It scares me to death. <laughs> but it's all right. It's, it had to happen. And he's taller than me, too. He's like six foot four. Like, goodness. Like, and he doesn't like playing basketball. I'm like, just stand there and put your hands up. <laughs> and you're going to have four years paid for it some school. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, but he's got to live his own life. And I'm very much about my kids, you know, like figuring out their own path. So, um, when I, a couple of years ago, he wanted to play this uh, Pokemon uh, tournament, like playing video game on his little uh, Nintendo DS deal. He wanted to play this tournament, and I was all about it. It's like, cool, you know, that sounds like fun. And you can play it, um, you can just play it online and things, and like, that's really great. And so he joined the tournament, and he's all excited about how he's going to win and how he's going to do all this stuff, and he loses his first game. And he quit. <laughs> he quit. And he didn't tell me that he had quit because I had asked him, well, when's your next stuff? Like a, like a week or so later. And he's like, well, I'm not doing it. I'm like, what? I mean, why aren't you? I don't want to go play games. Like, I didn't understand it. Like, I was really confused. And we talked a lot. And there was a lot of excuses. A lot of excuses of why he quit. And, but it would really boil down to this idea that he was not a natural success. He went in with the predisposition up here that he was going to succeed. Game after game after game. And not winning, he felt like he wasn't a success, he couldn't be a success, and that uh, everybody was better than him. So here's big truth. Everybody thinks everyone else is better than them, right? <laughs> like we're always, we're always thinking that other person's better than us. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Charles uh, Coolidge says, I am not who you think I am. I am not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. We, can, we get into this limited mindset where we start letting everybody else write our life for us. That we start to try to be the person we think they want us to be. We have no idea what's going on in their mind. They're not, they're not giving us a list, you need to be this way. If you're not this way, I won't be your friend. <laughs> you know? But we, we feel like we have to play that part. You know, that we need to be the person that that we think they think we think they are. And it's such a weird concept. And, um, and that's where my son was, though. And he was in this really limited mindset of writing his story that he was not a success and he was not going to be good enough. But the thing is, is that we're, we're spending too much time playing that role of someone else that's cast for us. That's a ridiculous way to spend your life. You know, I'm not, I'm not a religious person um, for stuff that's happened. And... Uh, but I'll tell you what, I also don't know what happens when we die. I don't know. There might be a heaven, there might be a hell, there might be a reincarnation. There might be something else. There might be a dominoes. I don't know. But <laughs> I do know one thing. I do absolutely know one thing. This life is it for this life. This go around in this body, in this mind, in this set, in this circumstance, it, this will only happen once. The, everything that came together to form who you are will only happen one time around. If there's another time around, it's going to be different. If you move on to a heaven, it's going to be different. But right now, that's it. And are you going to let someone else dictate how you live this life? It's a crazy idea, but we do it so much. We do it all the time. And we're so afraid to change it. We're so afraid to, like my father, it's just chasing after the roadrunner all the time, right? It's doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting something to change but doing it the exact same way and playing this part that someone else has cast you to be. And that it really is like we, we can do this and we do it to other people as well. You know, we expect, well, you, you expect to be this way, you know, and, and I expect you to act this way because you're my, you're my support and you're the villain and you are this, you know, and we, we, we cast all these roles in our life of all these people, a nemesis, and they don't even think about you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Now, you know, they, you, you're, you haven't come across their mind once in the last 48 years, and <laughs> you're constantly concerned about getting back at this person or, you know, or how they made your life so terrible. Um, and 
unfortunately, we start to do that, and then we, this, this voice here, this crazy, stupid little voice starts replaying that, the negativity, and, and trying to do that. And we get into this idea. So when I was a kid, um, we moved around a lot. Some of it was in southeast Idaho, but sometimes lived in Utah with family or Oregon and Washington. I moved 26 times before I was 17 years old. And, uh, yeah, my dad had lost his job and, you know, just trying to get it. And so sometimes we'd get farmed out. And I was homeschooled, too, so that made it easy to get tossed off on people, you know, because I didn't have to worry about things. So I did pretty good at, like, making uh, friends around places, but they, it wasn't, you know, huge lasting friendships. But, but something I noticed <laughs> when I would be in these different places, and I'm, you know, approaching teen years and these formidable years when you start listening more and more to your peers, and people are like, man, your nose is really big. You know, when are you going to get braces and fix the teeth? You know, like all this type of stuff. And so I started to develop a negative outlook on who I was because I didn't look like everybody else looked, you know. And so my teeth are terrible and my nose is terrible and, you know, no one's going to ever think anything nice about me. And like, and so that voice was playing in my head, this little tiny voice about my looks. And, um, and that, that played through and, and it still kind of was there. Certainly in my twenties, I, I stayed off a camera. I didn't do camera work for a long time. I worked behind the camera because I was afraid of how I'd look on camera. Because my tooth, my tooth is going to look weird. I don't look like everybody else. Okay? What a silly thing to think. By my 30s, I just stopped caring. And by my 40s, I have hair still. And so, like, I'm a god out there. <laughs> so the rest, I'm sorry. <laughs> but... <laughs> I really, <laughs> but it's silly little stupid things that we do, and we play these voices. Someone says one thing, and it was probably just some offhanded comment. It didn't really matter, right? It didn't matter. So you're going to be thinking for the next 10 years, that Clark Chamberlain, son of a bitch. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, like, we can, get, we can get into our heads what other people think, of, what we think they're really thinking. And they might say something one time, but that doesn't mean it, right? That doesn't mean anything. Like, what do we think about ourselves? What are the I am nots? What are the I am nots? I am not, I am not smart enough. What are you, what's an I am not that goes through your head? What's an I am not? I am not skinny enough. I'm not skinny enough. I am not pretty enough. I am not smart enough. Smart enough, right. I get these things. I'm not uh, dedicated enough. I'm not working hard enough. I'm not making enough money. I'm not doing, I'm not, I am not. And we keep telling ourselves, I am not, I am not, over and over again. And it just will just stop us. It will stop us, and you'll be eight years, I am not in yourself, because you're not, you know, you're thinking you're not enough. You know, and it's such a terrible thing, such a terrible thing to get into. And it can just happen over and over. Um, but the truth is, you know, like when we're born, we're all born average. Okay? We're all just average. We're all just people. We all look different. We all think differently. We all have these, all these things. And if we want to have the success in our life, if my son wants to have that success, we need to be willing to fail. We need to be willing to fail and to get up and to fail and to get up and to fail and to get back up again and keep getting back up. You know, if you think, <laughs> think about this. Let's combine these two things together. Think about like a toddler. Toddlers just get back up, right? They fall down, they get back up. What would the toddler do? He's like, oh, Bradley's been walking for the last two weeks. Why should I even bother? <laughs> you know, if mommy would just buy me Pampers, then I could walk. <laughs> you know, like, like th- could you imagine that? Like, it's ridiculous. But we tell it to ourselves all the time. We're always telling ourselves why it's someone else's fault, why we don't have what we need, or what, how we can get to the next spot. Or that because someone else is better, why should we even try? Because they are doing it better than we could do it. So why do we even bother continuing to go out and, and work? And so, and then again, it just gets us into that point. And it's really funny. Why, if, if we think of ourselves, if we're thinking that this is writing, we're writing our life story, we're creating this reality, why do we keep casting ourselves as a helpless victim? Why do we not cast ourselves as a hero? You know, we're always casting ourselves into a lower role, and we're not willing to step up. Now, some, there's, there's real reasons for this, of course, you know. Like, every person has got a reason to hold themselves back sometimes. When I lost my kids, I, 
If someone came in and said, well, you just need to buck up and, you know, get off of that couch and go try again. No, I needed some time. I needed some time. There are times to grief that's a real process, right? But once I know now, because now I've gone through two little, little spurts of really bad things like that happening. The second time around, I started listening. And once I started whining to myself in here, once I started telling myself that it was someone else's fault, I knew it was time. I knew I'd, I'd done enough. I'd healed enough. Because once I can start complaining, I'm ready to go again. Like that was, that was my cue. And I didn't know that before. And I had complained for all those years in between, between losing my children and going into the military. And I just continued to complain in my head. You know, it was always someone else's fault. If I'd just done this or that, had this opportunity. And that's just the negative way to be about it. And there are, again, there are things. Like, things are bad. <laughs> there are real reasons to quit. There are real things in life. That, that's, you know, excuses can be very valid. And, but they only so much. Like, you've got to decide. Is that, is that the life? One life? Is that the one that you want? Or do you want to cast yourself back as a hero and start working hard. Again, it's hard. Life's hard. Okay? I don't ever want to discount that. Life is not easy, you know, and, but, it's, but you have to be willing to get back up, and you got to remember to be a toddler again. You got to remember that you're willing to just keep trying and failing and trying and failing, because eventually the success starts to come. So the other thing we start to get into is occasionally we have this moment, you know, um, and we start thinking to ourselves, wouldn't it be great if... Wouldn't it be great if? And wouldn't it be great if I was the person who got the ticket for the million dollar Monopoly win at Albertsons? Right? Wouldn't it be great if? <laughs> I was really concerned because the first day we went in there and I would bought some stuff and they're like, you play Monopoly? I'm like, no. They're like, we well, got a lot of tickets. I was like, just give them to the person behind me. And so I, got, I had this little heartbeat flutter thing because I'm like, please don't be the Albertsons. Please don't be that Albertsons. It wasn't that Albertsons. So, whew. <laughs> but we do. We, th- we think of that. Wouldn't it be great if? And we get into our heads all the time. If, if It would be great if we could do this, but I, I really can't because of all these other things in my life. And um, if we, let's, let's say, you know, wouldn't it be great if, you know, my kids would do, would be, would, <laughs> would be more willing to clean up after themselves? Wouldn't that be great? Right? They, they would take care of themselves a little bit. Well, what am I not doing? Like, what's holding me back? from having that real conversation with them about you need to clean up your stuff. Because we get, we're afraid sometimes, even with our children, we're afraid sometimes to have the conversations that we need to, or we're like, why aren't they just listening? Why aren't they just listening? I've told them this a million times. Well, they're kids. You know, sometimes it's a million and one conversations to have with them. But if we're, t- if we're starting to think of, wouldn't it be great if, well, then we start to need to look at what, um, what are we need to do and shift in our minds to make it happen. And, boy, sorry, I'm going to, go, how much time we got left? I'm going to have to skip some things. So, <laughs> I always think that this is never going to be, you know, it's going to be plenty long enough. I'm going to run out of stuff to say. But, um, so, the last six months, I was mentioning that, you know, that, um, so it was 2015. Uh, I, we're, we're back. I'm still in the National Guard, and we did a, a training out in um, California, out of Death Valley at Fort Irwin. And I got hit in the face. It broke my nose. It gave me a concussion. This is the second TBI, traumatic brain injury, that I received. The first one messed up my pituitary gland, but it didn't do much m- mentally. But that one, all of a sudden, I started noticing loss of concentration and focus. I was more snappy. Like, I, I wasn't, uh, I couldn't have my communication, which has never been fantastic, <laughs> was getting worse. And, um, and it was really t- tough because it was this major shift. And that's what, that's what had happened. Like last year, all of a sudden, um, you know, marriage was falling apart because I, I just wasn't being able to communicate the way I needed to. Um, the, the major contract, I, I decided um, to put all my eggs in one basket because that seemed more efficient to carry. <laughs> But apparently that's a bad idea, and uh, it clearly it was because I, I lost my major contract down, um, down in Texas. And so I was scrambling, right? I got all these things happening in health, and I'm trying to pull this stuff all back together. And I was like, I, I just fell asleep for a month almost, you know? Like just, I just couldn't deal with it. Like it was just too much. Sometimes, sometimes our body gets to that point where we just can't. There's just so much on us, and we need to allow it to change. We need to allow it to shift some things. And... Um, and Coming out of that, again, 
this was the negative self-talk coming into my own mind. I knew it was time. Okay, it's time because I'm telling myself, the TBI will never allow you to get what you want anymore. The TBI is now that since that happened, you'll always be um, subpar in your ability to think. Because I, I get really, I'm like, I'm like a toddler. Like I get, it's like nap time in the afternoon. And it's really hard for me to focus in the, in the evenings especially. I used to be like a 12-hour worker. And I loved it. And uh, now it's a lot more difficult because of the, the mental fatigue that comes along with it. And I recognized that I needed to take that. TBI accident, you know, the, the, the accident that happened that shifted things in my mind, and I needed to change how my perception of it was. I needed to re-edit that story. And so I started to look at it, and I said, well, Peter Parker got bit by a, by a spider and got his superpower. So I wrote on my mirror, I got bit by a radioactive metal plate, you know, that broke my face and did that. Because what that's done for me now, it's, it's making me work harder. It's making me find new ways around it. It's making me learn to be a better person. And I couldn't have had that happen without it. Again, you have to take some time. You cannot, happens today, you're not going to be in that mindset tomorrow. You have to figure out where you're ready to make that shift. When you have, when you have grieved, when you have processed, you're ready to then shift and move on and adapt and change. And I had reached that point. And things are getting much better for me now. Like this next month, I've got, I'm back to working with some of my regular authors again, um, getting back into speaking more. I, I taught one semester here at the college, that, which was tough because it was a night class. But I needed to see if I was ready to get back out and start doing more things. And this opportunity, which is nice. Again, like I'm still playing this real iffy game. I'm trying to you know, make sure I'm, I'm ready to do this. Um, but I had to make that change. And there was a few other changes. And so I want to give you some steps here uh, on how you can do this. And so the first step is you need to have a direction. You need to know where it is that you're trying to go. You, you will never get, well, you might get there eventually to San Diego if you walk towards Cleveland. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so if you don't know where it is that you're trying to go, it's going to be really hard to get there. So you have to have a direction. You have to know what it is that you want. Again, it's, a, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, if you want to own a house in Jackson Hole, you can't stop living paycheck to paycheck in Idaho Falls, right? There has to be a major shift there. My mom last year was in a, in a real pinch with her money, and she's like, I need this amount of money that will get me by. I'm like, stop telling me what you need to get by. I need to know what you need to get through. You know, what is it that you need to do to change to get over this? Because we've got to stop having this conversation here, okay? And so what does that mean? What does that mean, you know, and that's, this type of idea can be anything direction for your relationships, direction with your children, direction with your education, direction with your job, direction with just life in general. But you've got to know what it is that you want. And uh, the second step, and uh, with that, also that self-examination. So the second step is what is stopping you? And what is it, what is real, you know, if you look at what's stopping you, and if you put my boss, if you put <laughs> my husband, if you put my, my significant other, my, my child, Re-examine, <laughs> okay? See what really is really stopping you, what is really holding you back there. And, um, and then committing to yourself. Now, when you commit to yourself, this can be really difficult because it requires self-love, which is sometimes really hard. That voice, the I am not voice, telling you over and over again that you're not enough can be really hard to get out of your head. And it's sometimes really hard to, to love yourself. Um, I... Uh, I've, I found, you know, that, uh, that with the TBI and, and moving away, like I've been trying to get healthier and healthier over the past four months, five months, and so I've really stopped drinking a lot. I cer certainly stopped drinking at night. And the first thing was, I was like, man, these nights are a lot longer. And <laughs> the second thing, well, the second thing at first was, oh, I really don't like hanging out with myself. <laughs> so, so that gave me a lot of time for self-reflection and to look at myself and to, to re-examine who I was and, and get better with who I am and feeling better about who I am as a person. Because I'm perfect in this moment, at this time. Everything that I've done in my life has brought me to this exact moment and that this is exactly perfect for where I'm at. Now, if I want to do something more, then I've got to make some changes. But if I want to stay where I'm at, this is perfect, right? Um, and so commit to yourself to do that. So, Self-love, like one of the other examples I could give real quick, you know, is that um, 
to be on your path, you know, like being an example, if you have kids, being an example to them. So my father, again, he was a coyote. And I, I, I respect him and I loved him for what he did in my life and, show, you know, all the sacrifices he made for me. But, had he, but I made a ton of sacrifices for other people too because of that. Self, what I was seeing as self-sacrifices and then becoming bitter, you know, for the sacrifices I have to make. And that's the wrong way to look at things. And I, I really, you know, if my father really would have changed the reality of his situation, moved us to a different part of the, the country perhaps, uh, stopped trying to go in the way that he had thought, this is the only way I can do it. I have to get a, a, a job and, and be here. Maybe he could have started a business or maybe he could have done something else. But what can we do with our kids, right? You know, if we really want to show them uh, a great way to live, shouldn't it be trying to have the best life that we can have, to really be true to ourselves and to love ourselves and to have that and to be willing to make sacrifices and changes that actually get us closer to what it is that we want instead of pulling us back away from what it is? that we know will be the best thing for us. Amazingly enough, we actually do know what's best for us. <laughs> it's, but it's getting confident enough to listen to that voice, the good voice. Um, give yourself permission, you know, that you deserve to actually have the life that you want to, that you can actually deserve to not have negative self-talk going on in your head all the time, that you deserve more than that. Um, number four is to, uh, to, to change the I am not to just I am. I am good enough. I am pretty enough. I am smart enough. I am able to uh, accomplish tasks. I am able to make changes in my life. Be your biggest support, you know, like you should be your biggest support out there. It's certainly not, not, uh, not the opposite way. Um, number five is to just be prepared for failure though. Hey, okay? everything will not go perfect. Everything will not work the first time. You've got to figure it out, and you've got to be willing to commit to keep moving forward with it is, what it is that you want in your life. One of the things that has helped me um, when I'm, things are good, I write letters to myself, and I seal them up for when things are bad to remind myself, hey, you know what? Remember that things suck sometimes. Remember that you can pull through this. Remember that you've done this several times before. You can do it again, and maybe things suck right now, but things can get better and uh, if you just keep trying. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, every morning, I start uh, with gratitude in the morning. You know, if, you, if you're religious and you do prayer, same kind of thing, gratitude. I even get on my knees for gratitude because I just think getting into a position of being submissive to myself and to be grateful for what it is that I have and being grateful for what I don't have yet. Being grateful for trying to chase after what it is that I want in life. Um, sometimes you just need to completely change everything to get out of whatever is going on in your mindset. Sometimes you have to, you know, uh, occasionally I'll go work at a coffee shop or something instead of working in my office. Um, sometimes I need to, I used to do cartwheels. I can't do them <laughs> very much so much anymore. It just hurts too much on the, everything. But, uh, but I pound sometimes. I get, and I pound my chest because that physical change sends endorphins sends different things through my body it's it's a it's a very very physical change yelling or just you know, singing a big song or something or listening to music something that changes everything that's going on at this moment because when you change it it can be very positive even anger can be positive if you can redirect it the problem with anger sometimes is then we start directing it back at self-pity and then at uh, hatred. But if we can use anger just to change the moment, to get us out of that moment, it can be very powerful. Um, so finally, a uh, checklist, you know, are you being honest with yourself? Are you, are you carrying hate? Think about, like, if you go to the gym, the guy who, you know, just is like lifting 400 pounds, very strong person, he doesn't walk out with a 400 pound weight on his back. Okay, his strength comes from ripping the muscle down and leaving the weight at the gym. That hate and the pain in our life, losing my children, immense amount of pain when I could finally heal and let it go so I wasn't carrying it around with me all the time. Immediately, like, I had more strength in my life, right? There was more strength that comes through pain. But we have to let it go. If we just hold on to the hate and we're constantly hating all the time about it uh, or self, negative self-talk, that's not doing us any good. Um, and then do you surround yourself with people that inspire and support you? And if you don't, are you prepared to have the talk, the real honest talk with the people in your life? You know, that you can, you can tell them what it is that you need and have the real conversation. So I really hope that <coughs> some of this has been helpful for you. Um, this, again, stuff that's worked for me. And, re and getting rid of the negative self-talk in my head 
which helps me be more successful in my day-to-day -day life. But I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk with you today. Thank you.